Hi everyone and welcome to another video for signals and systems. In this video we'll sketch the frequency response magnitude for a square pulse. In a previous video we derived the frequency response for the square pulse. Here we're just going to work on sketching that um, frequency response magnitude from the equation we derived. So let's get started. Okay, in the previous video, we started with this square pulse illustrated here. Um, it's equal to 1 between 1 and 6. Um, and we derived this equation for the Fourier transform, the discrete time Fourier transform. Um, so the DTFT consists of a phase factor, complex exponential phase factor, times something that looks like sine over sine. Uh, so do, we derived that previously, and now our goal is to figure out how to sketch the magnitude based on this expression. Okay, so this is um, the equation for the magnitude. All right, so we're taking the magnitude of this expression. The thing we can remember is that the magnitude of a product is the product of the magnitudes, so we can just multiply the magnitudes of these two parts. Um, and if we look, the magnitude of this term here, it's just the magnitude of a complex exponential, and that is, uh, we know, equal to 1. All right, so that term we can go ahead and, and ignore because the magnitude is just 1, and then we focus on sketching the magnitude of this, um, of this piece. Um, so we notice we have a sinusoid on the top, a sine on the top, and a sine in the denominator. The sine on the top has a higher frequency, so it oscillates more quickly. The sine on the bottom oscillates more slowly. Um, and so we um, know from experience, from looking at other similar responses like this, we know that this looks like what we would call a discrete time sink right? It's of the form sine over sine, all right? So it's a discrete time type of, it's another form of a sinc function. Um, it's not just sine x over x, it's sine something over something, okay? Um, but we know kind of what that looks like um, from our experience looking at other ones, but we want to figure out what this specific one um, looks like. And so it's always good to start off by looking at where the numerator and the denominator go to zero. So where are the zero crossings? Um, and so if we look at where the zero crossings are, the zero crossings of sine of three omega hat, well, that sine goes to zero wherever the argument is a multiple of pi. Um, so that's three omega hat is equal to pi L, where L is just some integer. So we say that these zero crossings, we solve this equation, are at pi over 3 times L. Um, so let me just write that a little more clearly. So pi over 3 times L. So multiples of pi over 3, the numerator will go to 0. If we look at the denominator, the denominator will go to 0. Well, it, the denominator is sine omega hat over 2. And that goes to zero when omega hat over two is a multiple of pi, or omega hat is a multiple of two pi. Okay, so that is starting to, rem or that is one way to remind us that this whole expression we know is a discrete time Fourier transform. So it's got to be periodic with period two pi. So we expect um, some repetition with two pi. Um, and so then we can also say, well, what is it going to be equal to um, at, say, 0? Um, and then what it's equal to at 0 is also what it's equal to at 2 pi. So if we're looking at x of e to the j omega hat at omega hat equals 0. Well, if we look at this expression up here, we notice, well, if I plug in 0 here and 0 here, I get something that's 0 over 0. So one way I could figure out what's going on there is I could use L'Hopital's rule and solve for, I take the derivative of the top, the derivative of the bottom, and then plug in for omega hat equals 0. But another way is simply to remember that x of e to the j omega hat when omega hat equals 0 
is just equal to the sum of x of n over all n. And that's because the form of the equation, right? Normally, the Fourier transform is x of n times e to the minus j omega hat n. But when omega hat is 0, that just becomes 1, and we're left with this expression. Oh, well, so then it's just the sum of the values of the signal. Well, that's easy to calculate because we know we only have six non-zero points in the signal. So in our case, this is just going to be equal to six. So we already know a few values here. It's equal to six at um, minus two pi plus two pi and uh, zero. Okay, and it repeats outside that. Okay, so now we have to kind of um, use our intuition about what this should look like. We should get something here that varies kind of sinusoidally. Its peak is at zero, um, and then it goes down to zero at where this hit, where the denominator or the numerator hits at zero crossing. So at pi over three, uh, two pi over three, etc. So let me just draw on here. Let's see. This will be pi, and then I'll divide this into thirds. So that's pi over three, two pi over three. This will be 4 pi over 3 and 5 pi over 3, okay? And so we know it's going to go to 0 at each of these points due to the 0 crossings of the numerator. And we can just kind of draw through here. And again, you have to have kind of seen one of these before to know what the rough drawing should look like. Um, let's see if I can repeat this over on this side. So it's going to go through the zero crossings. I'll just sketch the zero crossings in place. Okay. All right. So, um, again, I had to kind of know what this looked like from my previous experience of looking at stuff in class. Um, but the key thing was I found the value at the peak. The value at the peak is just the value of the frequency response at zero, which we can do using L'Hopital's, or we can do just computing the sum of the, um, the, sum of the, the signal x of n. Um, and so that's equal to 6. Um, and then I found the zero crossings just by knowing that sine goes to zero whenever the argument is a multiple of pi. So I solved for that expression for both the numerator and the denominator. The denominator is what gave me the two pi periodicity. Uh, the numerator is what gives me the zero crossings at multiples of pi over three. So this is a rough sketch. And again, I want to emphasize my sketch doesn't quite look symmetric here, but this should be um, symmetric about uh, the origin, right? Um, okay, so that is how you sketch the frequency response of a simple square pulse um, using knowledge of what sine over sine looks like um, when you sketch it, being able to find the zero crossings and find the max value. So that concludes uh, the video on how to sketch the frequency response of a square pulse. It was made for the ECE 201 course at George Mason in fall 2018. Uh, if you want more information about Mason, our School of Engineering, the ECE department, or me, you can check out these websites. Thanks for listening.